it was getting to the point about half an hour ago where I thought you were all going to steal my thunder and I needn't bother doing my presentation, but thankfully we dealt with a few questions in there. During this presentation in your pack, you will find some draft, as in developed by NOG and not consulted on with services scenarios, and you will find the draft list as well. So if you'd like to refer to them as I'm talking, that would be good. So I'm part of the content team within National Operational Guidance. Uh, John is our line manager, and there are four of us who work in the team. Well, there's actually five if we include Aidan Bartley, who is our uh, support. We have uh, Bob Reary from Scottish Fire and Rescue Service. We have myself from Durham and Darlington. We have Lisa Hicks, who you will meet tomorrow from London Fire Brigade. And we have Bryn Powell from East Sussex. So our team spans the, the whole length of the UK. Right, so... We're going to introduce the concept of scenarios to you over the next half an hour. How the session's going to run is I'm going to tell you a load of stuff, and then we'll break out into some syndicate groups. There are rooms across the corridor. You'll have about half an hour to discuss amongst yourselves what you've heard during my presentation, and there are some questions in each room that we'd like to put to you to stimulate your discussions, and then we'll all meet back in here and we will continue the questioning about scenarios, no doubt. So if you have uh, lots and lots of burning questions, note them all down and you'll get the chance in the plenary session. So why do scenarios? If you remember back to the evolution of National Operational Guidance, their remit was to condense all of the thousands of fire service documents that existed into a usable platform for policy writers to inform local fire and service policy. And then as the work of the program developed, 50 fire and rescue services came forward and said, what we're all going to have to do is the same thing 50 times locally. We're going to have to take what you've written and we're going to have to interpret that to technical and operational guidance locally. Some of us with very small teams and very limited resources, why does NOG help us along that journey and make that step as small as possible for us to implement NOG locally. So that is what we've been doing. Also having um, scenarios with tactical <coughs> content, links to training specifications, it allows us to make that link to training and to firefighter competencies. And as Nick's mentioned several times, it's up to you whether you adopt, adapt, or reject national operational guidance, as an employer, you still have your legal duty towards your employees. Make sure the clicker goes the right way. Okay, so in the foundation of incident command document, the foundation for incident command, there's a section in the front that talks about how incident commanders make decisions, and there, that's a whole other day to talk about, but just a quick recap. Incident commanders take cues from what they see at an incident, from the information that they receive when they speak to witnesses, and from your operational risk information that they read. They develop cues, and that leads them to make decisions in different ways. So we have very fast ways of making decisions, which is the condition process and the recognition primed decision process, which requires you to recognize the cue that's there, to have some kind of memory based on either knowledge or training or previous experience, and then to apply a decision based on that. And in more steady state incidents, you have analytical decision making, which allows you to much more time to consider different options and to develop new solutions to situations that you may be unfamiliar with. So what are tactical actions? Tactical actions are now in all of our documents, apart from performing rescues, which has been developed and is almost ready for consultation. So in the next three months before the NIF in October, you will be getting performing rescues to consult on. What they do is to provide prompts to action for the incident commander to implement control measures. They're not instructions. They enable activity to be carried out safely on the fire ground reducing risk and improving firefighter safety. Hopefully they avoid decision traps, especially from firefighter uh, incident commanders who have a kind of tunnel vision and don't look at the big picture or base their assumptions on uh, an outcome that doesn't meet what it is that they're faced with. 
So hopefully they're to help incident commanders to make good decisions. They also avoid incident commanders having to follow rigid procedures that have on occasions in the past prevented rather than enabled safe activity to take place. They should be written in plain English and we use active language so that meets the need of a wide range of experience of incident commanders from low call stations in Stornoway in the far north of Scotland to the high call stations in, such as South St Mary's in Southampton. They should be unambiguous to every incident commander who picks it up and reads it. So a scenario is, it's a compilation of these tactical actions and they're drawn from across the framework of national operational guidance and they're collated relevant to a specific or to a range of incident types. We had a question earlier, I can guarantee you that none of the content is new. It is drawn from the framework of national operational guidance. It is drawn from the documents that we have consulted your fire and rescue services on the tactical actions for. So they're based on the activities that are likely to be carried out, the hazards that may or may not be present at that incident. Conversely, when we build a scenario, we may not be able to identify all of the hazards that are relevant to that incident, and therefore you're still relying on your incident commander to make a dynamic risk assessment, to evaluate risk, and to choose safe systems of work. So what scenarios should do is they should prompt incident commanders to think about the right things to do to allow them to decide how to safely resolve that incident. And you'll see from the examples, they're structured around the decision control process, but what we're going to do is talk a little bit more about the decision control process in a little while. So, what is the scenario not? Is that good English or not? So whether you decide locally to adopt scenarios or not, these are the things that they're not intended to be. It is an instruction manual that tells incident commanders a step-by-step -step guide of how to resolve an incident or to how to use a piece of equipment or to apply a technique. They're not to replace local policies or procedures on how you expect your personnel to do things at an incident. So for example, a scenario may say where moving traffic is a hazard, you should close a carriageway or close a, consider closing a carriageway how you close the carriageway locally is entirely up to you. How far your firefighters step before they place the next cone and the next cone, that's local procedure. They are also not underpinning knowledge. You need to know about the national operational guidance in order to know how to apply the um, tactics that are in our guidance. Okay. So they're based on the principle of providing the right information to the right person at the right time and we'll see how scenarios work on the website in a little while, but they are scalable depending on the time pressures or the stage of an incident. So sometimes incident commanders will manage an incident using the decision control process and their experience and their training, and they won't refer to any of your service procedures or guidance at all. Other incidents, some incident commanders, based on their experience or their confidence, may wish to have access to prompts that help them to decide how, how to resolve an incident. In the past, some services have um, taken assurance from providing a lot of information to incident commanders via MDT, but that can be kind of discouraging to incident commanders if they're looking for particular information and it's, it's lost or hidden. And uh, we'll refer you to Justice Macduff, who said, there is a confetti of advisory papers intended to improve safe systems of work that are, in fact, counterproductive. So who might use scenarios? Policy writers, if you're all from policy teams in your service and you're developing local procedures and you're informing your local risk assessments, um, you can use scenarios to support the implementation within your service. Training departments can use these to develop, they, because they'll be linked to training specifications for firefighter competence, you can use them to develop training packages and to plan exercises and you can use them to develop individuals and as benchmarks for assessment of competence. And also, if you choose, if this is a route that your service chooses to take with scenarios, is that you could make them available on an incident ground to an incident commander. And they could use that as an aid memoir to support their decision making. They could use them to share situational awareness with other responders. 
they could use them for command support or to inform on a little risk assessment or for post-incident debrief. So you will see from the structure of the examples that we've given you is that they are based around the decision control process. So under situation, the first three boxes are incident information, resource information, and risk information, and they provide prompts on the things to do at that incident that an incident commander should consider. Uh, we've included some elements from the joint decision model, because as we've referred to a number of times, it is important that we are able to work interoperability with our colleagues from other agencies. So the colour scheme follows this, the headings follows that. So on the back we've got uh, objectives, tactical priorities and operational tactics, and then we have communicate control, and we have um, incident closure and handover that is from the National Operational Guidance. There's also a box for additional information, and the idea for that is that we can provide images and anything else supplementary to the tactical actions from NOG that would help an incident commander to support their decision making. For those services who haven't moved to using the decision control model, those services who are using the decision making model from the third edition of Incident Command, these are compatible. The, the only heading that isn't in that model, if you're still using it, is the tactical priorities. Uh, everything else fits with that Incident Command model if you're using that in your service. So it is a compilation of tactical actions, and it is all drawn from the guidance that we have. So this is an example. The example that we'll, right, I need to introduce the concept to you at this point of having an all incident actions document, which isn't actually a scenario because it's not linked to any specific incident type, but it underpins all of the other scenarios by dealing with the things that we do every single time that we respond to an incident. Things like carrying out a scene survey, uh, establishing a cordon, carry out a debrief. We've captured all those in an all-incident document, and what that's allowed us to do is to focus the content of the incident-specific scenarios on the things that are really critical that the incident commander is prompted about at those incidents. So, so this all-incident document draws on elements from operations, from incident command, and from environmental protection, provides prompts to incident commanders of things that they should be thinking about. The example that we've got on the screen is industrial and commercial. This is, uh, let's get on. So if we're talking about a fire in an industrial and commercial premises, we're going to draw technical actions from the fires and firefighting document, technical actions from fires in the built environment. And then because they're going to be working in a context, we're going to have technical actions from the industrial and commercial context document when that is complete and probably tactical actions from utilities and fuel and when we're building this scenario we may even include something from hazardous materials or something from performing rescues if we think that's relevant as a prompt to the incident commander for to safely resolve that incident so the process is that the content team in national operational guidance program will initially develop these using the tactical actions from the guidance that's already published. Then what we'll do with that is we'll ask service to peer review it. So one of your services will be involved in challenging the thinking behind why some of the tactical actions are included and others aren't. And then following that, it'll go out to a wider consultation with the 50 fire and rescue services, and you'll all be able to hold that up against what you do now and what is proposed in the scenario and say either you haven't done this that we've thought of, in which case we can go back to the guidance and look for it. If it isn't in the guidance, then you've helped us to identify a gap that we can do something about. So hopefully these will be generated on the collective knowledge of all 50 fire and rescue service policy departments and training departments and all of your risk assessors and you'll be able to feed back into national operational guidance whether there are things that have been missed. Okay, so in developing a list, there is a draft list, and we've been asking you over the last few weeks what you've thought of our list, and uh, we'll be giving a little bit more detailed feedback to the NAF meeting tomorrow afternoon, but a quick overview of what we've been doing. So the list is compiled using the National Incident Type List, 
what we've identified is that some of the categorizations in that aren't ideal for the purpose that we're putting scenarios to. So the only kind of aircraft incidents were either aircraft on airport or aircraft off airport. It didn't give us a great deal of scope in having an aircraft on fire or an aircraft not on fire requiring rescue. So maybe there's some tweaking in the language that we need to do. Uh, we have access to fire statistics now in much greater detail than published online. So we, National Operational Guidance have established that link with fire statistics so we can go and ask them which property type fires are the most frequently occurring or the least frequently occurring in the UK. Um, we have representation on CFOA Health and Safety Committee, so emerging health and safety issues from the UK Fire and Rescue Secretary will help us to feed scenarios because they, they are about firefighter safety. And then we're going to rely on your fire and rescue services to help us with what your IRMPs say are the risks to your services and what your local risk assessments say are the risks to firefighters. There are some projects that we can't deliver just at the moment, so we, what we did is we tried to do high-rise in completion, but what we found when we uh, compared them to a cross-section of high-rise policies that were uh, in the UK Fire and Rescue Service at the moment is that some of the hazards were to do with things falling from height or failures in the structure that resulted in firefighters being able to fall from height, and those hazards and those control measures are in a project that's ongoing at the moment, that's the subsurface height um, and structures project. So we kind of 90% finished that, but there were some hazards that we were, we were, uh, became apparent that we weren't able to put in there. Um, so what we, what we propose to do is to walk before we run. So what we'd like to do is to develop some common incidents that happen frequently across the UK that you have tried and tested risk assessments for and that you have well-developed policies and procedures locally for so we can test the process first let's get the process right and then we can move on to some more of the uh, low frequency higher risk incident types and then we can test them against the procedures but what we will do is we'll develop a time scale and we'll share that with you so we asked as part of our recent consultation about the all incident approach and nearly 90% of the fire and rescue services who responded, and we got 40 responses, which is pretty good, uh, said that that was the right approach to take, or they either agreed or strongly agreed with that approach. We also asked you about national incident type numbering, because you'll notice, uh, I think the example that you have is F4, and that's a domestic dwelling. 63% um, said that was very important or important, so it wasn't quite as convincing as the 90% for this, and then we'll discuss that in more detail at the implementation forum tomorrow afternoon, or you'll be able to... It was a bit more convincing than Brexit. <laughs> right, so we did get quite a lot of feedback, and thank you very much for that. When we send consultations out to your service, the, the more you tell us, the better we can develop the project, so thank you to those services who did send loads and loads of texts. We do appreciate it. So people suggested a lot of things that weren't on our list, and just what I want to highlight is that when we're developing scenarios, we take a hazard approach, and they're prompts for incident commanders to think about things rather than provide them an instruction manual on how to resolve that incident. And by taking that approach, it allows you to group similar incidents together and therefore reduce the number of procedures that you have locally for de dealing with incidents. So we had Hereford and Worcester said they had 83. I think my service had around 60, and I, I think Tyne and Weirs was closer to 100 in terms of the amount of operational procedures that they expect their incident commanders to be au fait with. So by taking a hazard approach, and it allows you to group incidents together and to reduce those number of procedures. So some services say it was a good starting point, and it, the list it probably is a good starting point. What it isn't, it isn't the finished list because a lot of the projects have yet to deliver and until we know the hazards and the control measures that are suggested by those projects, it will be difficult for us to say whether we can squeeze them into a single scenario that's useful or whether we need to break them down into more than one scenario. Uh, people ask for the scope to be included about each scenario, which it will be. So F4 uh, in the National Incident Type List includes 
kitchen fires, bedroom fires, a domestic garage. There's a, there's a list of subcategories, and we will scope what we've included in that scenario as we're developing with it. And that'll allow you to hold that up locally in your service and say, well, you're covering all these. We've got three different ones for that now, so you're missing control measures, and we think you should include these. Um, a lot of people say we have technical guidance for our crews. And yes, you do. I'd be very surprised if you didn't already have technical guidance for your crews. Uh, what scenarios offer you is they offer you a direct link to the national operational guidance and the robust assurance and approval process and the governance process that sits behind that. So all of our technical actions that are in scenarios are linked to the guidance and the guidance has been consulted on all your fire and rescue services, the wider fire and rescue sector, it's been through our OGG and it's been to our OGSB, the strategic board, before it's signed off and published on our website. It also allows for closer cross-border working. So Andy touched on it earlier. People are working in regions and you're developing regional things. So that helps when you work cross-border with services that are within your region. It doesn't help so much when you cross outside of your region. So a kind of more consistent approach nationally would help with those cross-border incidents. And what scenarios will do is they'll be maintained by a national operational guidance program. So we're going to hear a lot about learning tomorrow morning as we hear back from you that things have either gone well or not gone quite so well at operational incidents. That will affect the guidance and then therefore that will affect the scenarios. So they'll be maintained centrally by a function within the national operational guidance. So just one of the examples when we talk about a hazard approach, I'd just like to refer you to confined space. Um, so the GRAs, I think they covered silos and sewers and trenches, um, possibly another one that was caves and mines or something like that. When you take a hazard approach to all those incident types, actually the things that you want the incident commander to consider and the control measures that you want them to consider putting in place are all very similar. And that allows you to take that group of incident types and to have a single scenario that keeps the, inf keeps the thought process of the incident commander in their decision making on track. And one of the services, thank you very much, it wasn't a plan, said scenarios will be of huge benefit to our service. So thank you to whoever those were. Right, so how does it work? So they work across um, a range of platforms. Scenarios will be available on UKFRS.com. Whatever you, your service does with them after we publish them, it's entirely up to you whether you adopt, adapt, or reject the concept altogether. But they will be available from our website. They work on a variety of platforms. Uh, we were hoping to have an MDT here from Scotland because they're functionality of their MDTs allows for the scenarios to be expanded and contracted in the way that it will work on our website. Um, if your services like the concept of scenarios, but you see your MDT functionality as a barrier to you being able to adopt them locally, then speak to the NOG team and we might be able to speak to the emergency services network, airway replacement people about equipment and functionality. And we're running a project at the moment to develop a new online searchable library. So as part of that, we could ask the developers of that to m make sure that whatever they develop is available for your MDTs, if that is what you want scenarios to do. Okay, so on our website, currently we've got some examples just so that we could demonstrate what this works. If you go on to the published content, uh, guidance section on the right hand side of the scenarios and we've put some examples up there. There is no content in because you've, you've got draft scenarios and they haven't been consulted on. We're not going to publish them until we've been through a full consultation. So you click on any one of them. It brings up the headings as we've described that are matched to the decision control process and influenced by the joint decision model also. Clicking on any of the arrows will expand a section. So this is the so apart from the headings, this is the next level that it will allow you to access the content. So this example is the all incident that's not really a scenario. Um, and they are things that we think an incident commander should consider at every single incident that they go to. 
So by doing that, that allows you not to put them in the subsequent scenarios and focus the content of your subsequent scenarios on what is actually risk critical to those incidents. So these are all from uh, national operational guidance, as we've said. They, because it's the all incident one, they're either from operations or from incident command or from environmental protection. Everyone will be hyperlinked on the website. So if you want to read some more information about why it's important that you carry out a full 360 at the earliest opportunity, you can click on the hyperlink and it will open up a text box and it will take you to the control measure of situational awareness from incident command. And then all of the information about situational awareness will be there for you to read, should you wish. That's ideal for a kind of lecture room, study environment. So if, you, if you're going to use scenarios as a training thing for incident commanders, you might, they might access them on our online website, might read the things that they think they should do to gather incident information, and then they can go to the underpinning knowledge that exists within national operational guidance. So you can close that down. Every section is further expandable, so there are about 1,800 technical actions in national operational guidance at the moment, and all of our content isn't complete yet. There are projects ongoing, and there are projects to deliver next year. So it wouldn't be realistic to make them all available, but we put the most critical ones in the first level ex expansion, and then some more things that might be either useful to a command support function or in a training environment, we'll make them available also, and all of those will be hyperlinked back to the underpinning knowledge. So if you want to read more about why our guidance says you should consider doing that thing, you can click on the link and you can go and view why it is important that you consider doing that. The risk information section is slightly different in that when you expand it, it provides you with a list of hazards. So these are hazards that may or may not be present at an incident type, and these are suggested hazards that may be present at all incidents that we go to, so they're dealt with in the all incident document. And when you, when you expand these, it suggests some control measures that will allow you to control that hazard. So the example that I've used, body fluids. Any incident we go to, you could encounter body fluids. There are some control measures there from the operations document that suggests what you would want to do where firefighters are in contact with body fluids. And if you want to know more about that, you can click on the link and it'll take you to the, all the underpinning knowledge about casualty care and about why it's important to wear gloves, and you can access our content that way. So the content will still be accessible in the way that it is now, so you can go to the high-level activity or context documents and work down through the hazards and the control measures and find the um, tactical and strategic actions for your service, or you can do it the other way around. You can go and look at the tactical actions, and then you can read back up through the guidance to see when you close that down, that takes you back to the headings. Right, thank you very much. How long was that, John? All right. <laughs> okay, so if you um, check your badges, I took mine off because it um, interrupted with the On your microphone. On your badge, there's a syndicate room. Across the corridor, there are four syndicate rooms. A is the furthest left and D is the furthest right. We've got a couple of questions that we'd like you to consider. These are up in the room as well, so don't think they have to remember them or write them down. They're available in the room. Um, so syndicates A and B, what we'd like you to think about is how do you see the use of scenarios supporting operational effectiveness in your service? And I've suggested some ways, but you will all have different ideas about how scenarios will impact what you do locally. And syndicates C and D, we'd like you to focus on the challenges that you foresee for using scenarios in your services. And each of the rooms have the other question available as well. So if you run out of steam answering your question and you want to concentrate on the other one and feed back to us, please do that as well. And in about 30 minutes time, we'll all reconvene and you'll be able to put questions to myself and to the panel and to the rest of the NOG team about scenarios.